Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. We're also live here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. And today is Sunday, October the 2nd. It's the beginning of a brand new week. November 8th, 2016 is election day. And that will set, of course, a beginning of a new two-year terms for Congress. Right now, every member in Congress is a Republican or a Democrat, even if there was a couple of independents, a handful, like two or three. That would be unprecedented, independent or third-party candidates, I should say, since probably the Republican Party itself um, was a third party back in the 1800s. And so that's a long time. And uh, we've been interviewing independent third-party candidates who are on the ballots and who are the only third party or independent option in their specific district. Today we have an interview with Paul Rizzo, who's a libertarian for the U.S. House of Representatives in District 15 in uh, PA or Pennsylvania. His website is Rizzo, R-I-Z-Z-O, the number four, congress.com. We're delighted to have him with us here to do this interview so you can hear some of the options out there for the U.S. House. And we believe if uh, candidates on the ballot, the taxpayers are paying to have them on the ballot listed there and just as on the ballot as anyone else, that the media should cover these candidates just as much as anyone else. And he should be in the debates just as much as everyone else, etc. So, Paul, good to talk with you today. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. Is this your first time running for office? And if so, tell us how that's been and uh, why you decided to run this year and why you decided to run as a libertarian, sir, against the Republican and Democrat instead of being a Republican or a Democrat contender. Okay, well, that's a good question. I, I think the uh, main reason is I, I think there should be other options out there. Um, I've been a registered libertarian since 2012. I was originally a Republican for many years. Um, I came disenfranchised with both parties a few years ago. Um, that was the primary reason why I switched uh, parties. Um, this year, uh, especially, I was heavily involved in getting signature requirements to get Gary Johnson on the ballot. And uh, while we were doing that, we decided to see how many candidates we could get on locally and uh, federally uh, in Pennsylvania. And we actually did uh, accomplish a full ballot uh, for a lot of the districts. So that was cool. (laughs) Yeah, excellent, excellent. And you know what? It should be such a strange question because 42% of people identify as independent. Only, um, I guess, like 29% as Democrat, 26% as Republican. So, um, but... But the reason I ask is I guess there's just um, no independents or third-party candidates actually hardly, hardly in government anyways, maybe at some state <coughs> legislative um, le- levels. And, and, you know, then that's good. Um, so, uh, so maybe it shouldn't be such yeah, a Pennsylvania has the most. Yeah, Pennsylvania has the most uh, uh, elected libertarians to office uh, nationally. I think we have around 24 uh, but we don't have any wow. state reps. We're actually uh, actively really trying to get uh, state reps in and also myself in for Congress this year. And we are polling uh, fairly well. Uh, I was allowed into the debates. I have a debate uh, coming up the 6th uh, this week, and I also have one on the 11th uh, that will be televised. So I am looking forward to both of them. And uh, the response has been uh, fairly good. Uh, from all the voters, even when we were going knocking door to door, a lot of people were asking for a third option, regardless of what it was. I think a lot of people, you know, are pretty uh, dissatisfied with what's going on in Washington currently. Yeah, all right. So all two words that come to mind is competition and consensus. And uh, mm-hmm. and so um, what, what would it be like uh, having, you know, maybe this year it might be um, – you know, a game changer. Maybe there will be yourself and a few other independent or third party candidates, Um, you know, and it's probably going to build like that if that happens, like they'll probably be somewhere between two to 10, you know, one year and then two years from there, maybe they will be 10 to 25 and eventually we'll have 50 to hundreds, you know, and it may be a 10 year process and, and beyond, but what would it be like, do you think, um, what kind of impact would it have to the status quo of having like, you know, so there's 435 members of the U S house, hundred members of the Senate and that's our Congress. Um, 
Yeah. And uh, the third branch of government, just as powerful, in some ways more powerful. Um, and so uh, what would it be like to have, let's just say, somewhere between two to ten uh, members that are not Republicans and Democrats? How do you think that would affect the status quo, Paul? I think a lot, like with the Republicans and Democrats, a lot of times, and I've talked to a lot of people, when you vote, you know, you, you vote for the elected official or whatever your party think they stand for. And, and a lot of times, like when I was a Republican, I was, you know, I was pretty big on fiscally being fiscally conservative. And when I would vote for the candidate I thought would do the job, you know, we, we, we you know, we end up more in debt. So we're, you know, cusping 20 uh, trillion now. Um, if we had some third party members in there, I think it would even benefit the Republicans and Democrats that are voting because the people, they would understand that the people actually are serious about having their views expressed and they would hopefully represent the people better. Yeah. Put a little bit of pressure on them. It would up their game. Probably they would, you know, that would kind of, you know, wake them up a little. I mean, I would say a lot because it would be totally unprecedented. I think we've at times had one independent congressperson, I think Bernie Sanders, but he was alone pretty much. And you could maybe say Ron Paul, but um, he had, he of course, ran as a Republican. Um, so let's look at your issues list. People want to learn more about you here. It's again, Rizzo, R-I-Z-Z-O, the number four, congress.com. And um, so you have some links on here and uh, but your issues um, that you listed here, 13 of them, the Federal Reserve, LBGT, immigration, abortion, social security, freedom of speech, self-defense, governments, accountability, health care, foreign wars, military spending, trade deals, fiscal issues. Let's start from the bottom up here. Um, the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, um, would you want to audit the Fed or how would you approach yeah i'm I'm in favor of auditing the fed i believe that you know the american people don't really have any clarity on what's going on with our monetary policy and i would like to see at the very least the true audit of the fed um i i don't believe that we're being served well by them and uh, that would be my position on that so and should we audit like uh, some other departments or um as of our government yeah i believe there's reserve yeah there, there's a ton of uh, government waste. I'm, I'm a pretty big fiscal conservative, so yeah, I would be open to uh, looking at any departments like that. Don't really, we're not getting the bang for the buck. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's so many to start from. Uh, some of them are, you know, I think a lot of the government programs are designed to be well-intentioned, but they become very bureaucratic at the end of the day, and they don't serve as well. And some of them, I mean, a lot of them are auditable, but some of the big ones, um, you know, the Department of Defense, it's not really um, until just recently, there's starting to be a little bit of talk about auditing it. And, uh, and well, so, Pentagon um, can't even account for $6.5 trillion that they spent recently. So that's a big part of our budget, dep- I mean, our uh, national debt. Yeah, and it's not picking on them, but, I mean, that is our Department of Defense, and, you know, we the people should, you know, be able to audit it, I would think. And um, so well, we need and, government and, accountability. Yeah, and now actually, here's some more social issues, but they also are legal issues as well. So how uh, how about um, the L- LBGT um, community? How would you approach that on a federal level, sir? Well, I think, you know, there has been a lot of progress in that regard. You know, now that we have gay marriage and stuff, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I'm all for it. Uh, We were guaranteed the right to liberty and uh, the pursuit of happiness, and I see no problem with it. I never did. Uh, You know, and I'm actually a practicing Roman Catholic. I think we should all be entitled to live our lives the way we see fit and and live in uh, peace and prosperity. Yeah, equality under the law, you know, either have marriage for everyone or just get rid of marriage for everyone, I guess, yeah. you know, but it's got to be equal under the law. Um, I would say, I mean, that's what that's the argument the court had made. And uh, what about um, immigration? Uh, we're country immigrants, as you said. And so what is um, how would you approach our immigration policy? Well, I think, you know, the politicians, you know, some of them, and, you know, I'll name one, Trump is talking about deporting 12 million people. That just doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, we have people here that are, you know, 
all for all intents and purposes, they're uh, functioning in the economy and they're contributing to the economy. Uh, that being said, you know, when people come over the border and uh, they're here using some of, uh, you know, how would I say it, our, some of the uh, of our, our programs that are not necessarily designed for them, they're not entitled to that. You have to be a national or not naturalized or a U.S. born citizen to partake in some of those programs. So my theory on that is to curtail some of the immigration is if we take away some of the giveaways, they would actually uh, curtail some of the uh, illegal immigration. Now, regular immigration is fine with me. If you're coming here and you have a visa, you're working, that's absolutely fine. Um, I just actually met with a Syrian community up here because uh, I'm running for office and they were explaining to me their concerns. Um, about immigration and what they thought was the, uh, the the right course of action for the American government to take, and that was fairly interesting too. So they had they were actually anti-immigration, which I was surprised, but they were mostly hmm. Christians. Oh, oh. Um, well, uh, what what do you think would be some of the things that would help people? Um, you know, I guess integrate better into you know the American traditions well you're talking about assimilation into the population right right well i mean i don't think you ever truly assimilate i mean i'm from italian descent you know and my my father has customs that you know that's kind of handed down to me um and that's at the end of the day what's make us americans we're all different um that's what makes us a great melting pot so uh, as long as you come here, you're doing your job and uh, you're paying taxes and uh, being a good citizen, I have no problem with it. Yeah, and like you said, as long as you're equally paying taxes just as much as everyone else is. And the main thing is we do all have different points of views. The main thing is re- kind of like your issue here, the freedom of speech. You know, I might think one thing, but I'll totally fight for your right to disagree with me. And that's a real test. It's real easy to um, fight for someone's right if they agree with you 100%, but but I guess the real test of your principles is uh, fighting for someone's rights that does disagree with you, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, you can't take away somebody else's liberty in, on the guise of protecting our own. That's not right. Yeah, that would be hypocritical, actually, and um, mm-hmm. that, that really is the core issue, and um, so uh, what about abortion? You have here that listed, so um, we Please tell us your stance on abortion. Well, actually, uh, that's a good one. I am actually a practicing Roman Catholic. Uh, you know, as far as an option for me and my wife, uh, you know, it probably would have never been an option. But I do see the need, you know, as far as for women's health and for the viability of the fetus and everything like that, that there needs to be that option there. We can't criminalize that because if you do a probation on it, it would still happen anyway, and it would probably happen in a more unsafe environment. So that's yeah, why I actually... Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe some things are done more in the influence field or moral field, but not um, make a law about it. Kind of like when Kennedy was um, a Catholic, you know, but he kind of... Um, uh, you know, you did you right ran on a, a secular platform per se, and yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, so, secular uh, governments yeah. are where we should be. <laughs> well, and and that's that helps ensure everyone has like that equal First Amendment rights, and um, and w- now Social Security is the next issue here, um, and uh, please uh, tell us about uh, your uh, approach, your stance on Social Security, Paul. Well, my my approach on Social Security is kind of, it's a budget issue to me. I mean, I have parents that are elderly, and they are collecting Social Security, and I obviously don't want to take that away from them. But I think what we need to do is instead of spending all this money on foreign intervention that really don't serve any purpose, we should actually balance our budget, and then we can use that money for our social programs like Social Security and Medicare. Um, you know, I think there is a need for them. There might be a need for maybe a means test and maybe a heightened age requirement for it. But, uh, you know, I think that's a fundamental right almost to every American. Yeah, so I believe in the social safety net per se. And, um, and so, yeah, um, I, I mean, I'm, oh, I'm not preparing for one. 
uh, you know, I'm kind of, uh, I'm saving with the guys of maybe I might not have it uh, when I get older because we don't know what's going to happen with the budgets and everything like that. But um, my plan would be to try to save it if possible. Sure, absolutely. A lot of people um, are, you, you know, probably wise to do what you're doing, but a lot of people I think will probably, you know, need it and are dependent on it or paying into it, et cetera. And, uh, you know, so there is a government contract there. Um, now, your next issue here is freedom of speech. I think we kind of touched on that a little bit, but uh, you want to expand on freedom of speech a little bit more, Paul? Well, I mean, it's it's very simple. I mean, you should be able to say whatever you want to say. But, I mean, if you say things irresponsibly, you should be prepared for the consequences. So, um, you know, uh, that it's as simple as that for me. Uh, you know, I will protect somebody's freedom of speech, even though if I, if I don't agree with it. Um, but, you know, it does have limits. Um, so that, that, that's my position on that. Yeah, like, you mean like um, yelling fire in a – movie theater or something like that. Yeah, obviously, yeah, stuff like that where you're going to put somebody's, you know, uh, health at risk or something like that, yes. Uh, or... <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. And um, now, um, again, we're talking with Paul Rizzo, and uh, his website is um, Rizzo4, the number 4, congress.com. He's a, a candidate who's going to be on the ballot, the only third option on the ballot besides Republican or Democrat uh, this year in Pennsylvania's um, 15th district. Um, so he's going to be on the ballot November 8th, 2016. And uh, he's been in the debates. He has some more debates coming up. We're going over the issues on his website here. Uh, now you have here a uh, self-defense um, so, uh, yeah, could you expand on uh, self-defense, sir? Well, yeah, I think the Second Amendment is under siege right now, and I do uh, I do defend the Second Amendment right. I'm not actually – surprising to a lot of people, I am not a big gun guy. Uh, I have, you know, uh, 22 and, uh, you know, uh, a shotgun, but it's just for home defense. But, um, you know, as far as, like, assault rifles and stuff like that, I'm fine with that stuff, too. Um so I think you know a lot of people use them for sporting and target shooting. And uh, the founding fathers wanted to, to have the Second Amendment, and I agree with it. Yeah, and it's kind of like the First Amendment thing. You don't have to necessarily have all those guns to believe someone else has a right to do that, you know. And mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it, just like you don't have to agree with something someone else says to believe that they have the right to say it. And uh, so uh, – and then sometimes it even is more credible if you don't have like you know that all that stuff. So, anyways, um, uh, just like Ron Paul, he would always um, advocate um, you know decriminalizing drugs, but he said he's never touched drugs a day in his life. You know, so yeah, um, yeah, well, I, I have the same position on that too. Yeah, uh, if you're responsible for your own well-being. If you're going to do that, then that's on you. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going to ask you about the war on drugs uh, after um, your, your platform here, but um, because that is an important issue right now, and uh, looking at states like um, Colorado and Washington and Oregon and Alaska and Washington D.C. and California coming up. Um, so um, now, what about a government accountability? Um, so how would you, um, if you were elected uh, this November 8th and um, you start being the representative in 2017, January 1st, you're sworn in, um, how is Paul, Paul Rizzo going to approach government accountability, sir? Well, I think, you know, like an example would be like uh, TPP. We should actually have to be able to look at that bill before it's signed into law. There's a lot of things that have happened, like the health care bill, where we didn't even know what they were signing. And I think that all those things should be published and people should have a good amount of time to research them and actually be able to contact the representative and see if, uh, you know, if that's something they agree with or not. Yeah, we haven't even, it's like one of those, we're going to find out what's in it and after it's passed. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. if that's another issue itself, not just a TPP, but just, you know, knowing what's in it actually. And it's, um, yeah. I mean, they're you know, supposed to be re representing us, not hiding things from us. So, <laughs> Bills should be, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess some of them just seem 
like uh, Congress people have like, well, this one they do have a longer time to, to, to read over it. But some of them, I mean, you hear things like they have two days to read something over that is like, you know, the length of a novel or something. How could they possibly yes. read that and understand it in that short period of time? And then the people that are writing these bills, they put so much verbiage in there that it could be interpreted so many different ways that, you know, it's not really protecting the American citizen. It's almost like we put these bills in that have loopholes in them so corporate interests can actually make a buck off of it. So, yeah, And what about health care? So that's another issue you have. Um, you know, how would we approach the uh, – well, right now, I guess we're living under the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, Obamacare. <laughs> yes. I, I uh, disagreed with the Affordable Care Act because I thought it was an unfair tax put upon the American people. Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't support, uh, basically, we should try to find ways to take care of people better. One of the things I've learned over the years is we give the government money, they find a way to waste it. I would like to basically get more of the private sector involved. I have friends that work in the medical field, and they tell me these stories about how much Medicare pays them for certain services, and they essentially have to make up the amount for people that don't have Medicare. Uh, so it makes government malinvestment actually makes it more expensive for us. So I'd like to get government out of our medical as much as possible. Okay. And, um, and so, yeah, so you would vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Is that right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think most people actually in polls now uh, feel that way. Um, and you know what? Before government started getting involved in uh, the healthcare system, I believe you could get like a, uh, uh, you know, like catastrophic insurance policy for something like a hundred or two hundred dollars a year, you know, and yes. um, and so, and, and then you said you believed in health savings accounts and breaking down barriers across state lines as well. Yeah, and one of the other options I was looking at was, uh, you know, a lot of these. Um, pharmacies actually offer basic outpatient with a nurse practitioner or something like that for uh, medical care. And one of the ideas I, I had was to remove the corporate interest tax, not necessarily take it away from them, but have them reinvest that back into uh, their businesses where they could basically offer cheaper health care or at a lower cost uh, instead of giving it to the government and then having the government waste the money. Um, just the math on it, I was doing some research, and CVS, for instance, pays about $4 billion in taxes a year. If they reinvested that back into their business, um, you know, and there's about 120 million uh, outpatient doctor's visits each year, uh, do the calculation, I think it was like $7 uh, per visit, you could actually knock off just by giving that money back. So imagine if you took all the pharmacies, and basically had them create some sort of, you know, outpatient service, you could, I think, make basic health care a little more affordable for the average guy. Yeah, maybe a lot more affordable. I, I mean, um, there's so many. I mean, that's that sounds like a, a very interesting idea. Um, bring some, just like you want to bring competition to Washington, D.C. and Congress, maybe some more competition in the healthcare. I mean, honestly, you go to a doctor it's one of the few places you have no idea what the price is. It's not listed yeah, there at all or not know. even. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just kind of like um, some of these bills that are passed, you don't know until after, which is totally upside down in a free market type of system. I mean, that's not free market at all. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, as far as the health savings camps, I think, uh, you know, the Whole Foods has a pretty good thing there where they pay help the employees with the um, uh, with the health savings accounts, uh, which they can use for um, visits or they can use towards like a catastrophic plan. And um, which which isn't even a you, you can't even buy into a, a catastrophic plan with the Affordable Care Act. Um, it has to be yeah. full coverage. Um, yeah, I actually had to be on the Affordable Care Act a few years ago when I was laid off, and uh, it was uh, it was pricey then for me and my family. Uh, luckily, I was only on it for uh, two months. I had found another job right away, so I was thankful for that. But it was more expensive, and the uh, deductibles were a lot higher than what I had at my last job. 
Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. So uh, if um, well, I was, we'll come back to. I had a train of thought there, but um, but yeah, I had something to do about the deductibles and and having catastrophic. I mean, well, I was going to say insurance is. You know, like car insurance doesn't pay for oil changes and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, I don't know if insurance is even the right word for it, you know, although we yeah. should place a lot more emphasis on prevention in our daily lives. Um, w- now, here's a, a really big issue here. And, and um, you know, you have here foreign wars and you have military yeah. spending. Maybe we could combine that into one issue, uh, Paul, if you could um, talk about uh Foreign wars and military spending for a moment. Well, I think it's, uh, you know, we don't even know what's going on over in the Middle East anymore, uh, even in the Ukraine. And we seem to meddle in these things and we seem to make things worse. The, the word of the day in the early 2000s was terrorism. So we went over to basically take care of the terrorists. Well, I think we've created more terrorists with our foreign policy. First, we had nation building and now we have basically clandestine regime change. Uh, I don't think it's served us or the people abroad, any service. Uh, Right now, currently, we're involved in Syria, but we can't even name the players that we're funding over there. Uh, You know, we're dropping arms to people, but we don't even know if they're a friend or foe down the road. So my theory on this was that we should, even though as unpalatable as it sounds, we should work with our adversaries like Russia, Syria, um, and we have to work with our allies like Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait and those countries to basically see if we can get the situation under control. Uh, I think if we pulled out our troops, we would, you know, and basically stop bombing over there, we could kind of stabilize the situation with the regional partners there. The other thing I would like to do is, you know, we have a refugee crisis that's going on over there. And if we sell so much military aid to a lot of countries over there, like especially like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates, If we put pressure on them where we wouldn't do the military sales and told them to take in these refugees, we could helpfully help save lives over there instead of, you know, basically having no place for these people to go and creating a refugee crisis in Europe. Yeah, uh, it's it's hard to keep track of what's going on over there for sure. And we've been there for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, Afghanistan now is the longest you know, war, um, it's surpassed the Vietnam war. Um, and it's still going on. And, uh, and I guess you could in some way include the whole middle East into all of that. And we're spending a fortune putting our young men and women over there. And so, um, and there's a lot of spending there. And so you did already touch on trade deals, uh, saying that you would not support the TPP as a currently is or as you currently understand it because you haven't had the time to look over it honestly right well yeah i mean if you look at and we can go back to as far back as nafta if you look at nafta when we signed nafta we actually lost 56,000 manufacturing businesses in the united states but they said that we gained jobs i really don't believe most of that the jobs that we did gain were probably lesser quality jobs and shipping and, uh, you know, warehouses. Uh, We had a trade surplus with Mexico and Canada before we signed NAFTA. Now we have a, you know, a deficit. Um, I think a lot gets missed because we had the technology boom of the 90s, and that actually made the economy booming during that time. The other one that we entered into, well, where we let them enter into, was China into the World Trade Organization. Uh, Statistically, what I was looking at is currently – we lost 3.2 million manufacturing jobs with China. Now, as a libertarian, I am basically, you know, I like free trade. It sounds great. It's good on paper. But the problem that we have is we sign trade deals sometimes, and especially I'll use China in this example, they're not playing fair with us. They're doing currency manipulation, so they're flooding the markets. They specifically looked at certain markets to put out of business. We used to have a solar panel, uh, you know, a, a pretty decent solar panel industry in the United States, and the Chinese effectively flooded the market and put us out of business. So when we're talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you know, some of the countries that we're going to be dealing with, are, have they been good trading partners in the past? I don't know but it's something that we need to look at. My thought process on all the trade deals was 
I think that we should actually make things here. We ha- it's part of our national security, in my opinion. And one of the ways I would like to do that is basically by removing some of the corporate interest, or I mean, the corporate income tax for companies that produce things here. It's very important that we produce things here. Um, if we don't, we really don't have a strong economy as we think we do. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, corporate income tax is going to be transferred onto the people anyways, um, you know, through higher product prices. So it's not like, yeah. you know, any extra fees, you know, like you can even just look at your phone bill to, to, to see, you know, how they transfer all the fees onto the consumer. I mean, that is what's going to happen. Um so and, and it is kind of like a double tax because all the individual share, shareholders are also taxed on the individual level later on too when they do their taxes. So I mean the corporation itself is an entity, and then you have each individual shareholder per se. Um, so mm-hmm. what about um, fiscal issues? I mean uh, let's talk about um, the budget taxes um, and what we can do to help small and mid-sized businesses and just generally overall you know, America, I mean, is it 19 to $20 trillion budgets? Um, is that acceptable? How, you know, what would you like to see it at in 10 years from now? Well, I don't know the nominal number that it would be at, but I, I know some of the things that I would basically decrease spending on or advocate for decreasing spending on would be, Terry, uh, second would be the corporate income tax because we also have other issues that tie into this. As far as our economy, Uh, We have a whole generation of young people that went to college and they're out of school now and they have, they're laden with student loan debt. If we remove the corporate income tax from some of these companies that actually produce items, we could probably get them back in the workforce. I think we're looking at a big bubble there. We're also looking at some other bubbles that could possibly hurt us in the, in the meantime. Uh, If we get some fiscal sanity going, I think we could basically take care of what we have promised people and uh, move forward from there. Great, great. Yeah, and those are some specific um, items there, and we appreciate that. And so now just um, I did mention that did want to touch on the war against drugs. Um, actually, that is the longest war, um, even longer than mm-hmm. Afghanistan and et cetera. And it is a real war if you look at casualties and the militarization we're doing into it, how we're fighting other countries, et cetera. I mean, there's, it's an undeclared war, but it – you know, has all the same impacts as a war. And you know what, if someone, I totally respect someone saying that they don't want to do drugs. They don't want their kids doing drugs. They don't want to live in a community that has like a meth lab in their home, which could be argued that um, they probably wouldn't exist if there were more natural alternatives. But, you know, uh, we try prohibition with alcohol, but the real question is then what should be the consequences? Um, because it's, you know, if you're going to um, say something should be illegal, that's not the real question. You could say that, but but the real consequences are there's about a million people that are arrested every year for just simple possession of marijuana. Um, and, uh, you know, what are the consequences? I mean, this affects families. It affects people. Um, there's other states that are making it legal. There's people who want to make industrial hemp legal. We have to import it currently mostly. So, I mean, how would you approach it overall? I know it's a big topic, but uh, you well, know, what are your principal th- stances? Yeah. We have to look at where changes have been made, I think. And the only uh, good example that we currently have is Portugal. Portugal decriminalized drugs in 2001. Uh, drug use has actually decreased and also drug fatalities. Now, I'm not an advocate of drugs. I never have been. But I think that we have basically fought a losing battle. It's kind of like prohibition in the 20s. Um, In a lot of ways, I think we've created more uh, drugs by having the war on drugs. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, uh, you know, we say marijuana is illegal. So if somebody makes synthetic marijuana, that's probably even worse than regular marijuana, and that's being sold out on the streets. So my position on that would be at the very minimum to legalize marijuana because I do believe that it does have some medical uses. And I have friends that use it almost on a daily basis, and they are contributing members of society. Um, So that's pretty much my position on that. 
Yeah, I mean, we've had a war on poverty, and if you look at the numbers, they're exactly the same. You know, um, we've had the war on drugs. The numbers are exactly the same. In a lot of ways, a lot of ways, our society is a lot more violent. I mean, you know, there's just a lot of things that are, you know, have unintended consequences and just don't turn out the way that they're expected. And um, so, so, anyways, um, so let me ask you, Paul. I ask everyone this. Uh, you know, um, who is some of your favorite people, past or present, elected or not? Well, I think Ron Paul would be a big one there. Um, <laughs> I was a big Ron Paul supporter. Uh, currently uh, in office, uh, I would say just for what was going on, I think Trey Gowdy was trying to get to the bottom of it in the Benghazi hearings. Uh, I thought that was pretty good, some of the stuff he had. Uh, And then also, I'm very curious to see how Theresa May over in the UK will do with the Brit exit. So uh, that would be some of the people I would say right now. Excellent. Excellent. Very interesting. And um, and so uh, please tell us one more time some of your events coming up and, uh, you you know, your debates and any final, uh, you know, words of wisdom, per se. (laughs) Okay, Uh, the big one is probably October 11th. I have a Channel 39 uh, debate with my opponents, Charlie Dent and Rick Dockery. Uh, That's at 7 p.m. Eastern time, and uh, that's Channel 39. It's a PBS station locally here in Pennsylvania. I'm very much looking forward to that one. And then I was invited to a candidates forum uh, this Thursday, uh, which is at the local tea party uh, here in the Lehigh Valley. And those are the two that awesome. I have. Any words of wisdom is, you know, uh, we have to get involved in government. Uh, we, you know, it's it, we can't depend on somebody else to make things right. It's really up to the individual to get involved and at least give it our best shot, I think. Uh, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, my family has been very supportive of it. And I'm very appreciative of that. Sounds great. And yeah, so there, it, it, there's a lot more going on on November 8th besides the presidential election. And um, so, and that's one thing we don't even get in here. We are uh, focusing on Congress and hope that there's a lot more emphasis on these congressional races in the future. Um, you'll be able to re-listen to this uh, entire interview in 24 hours for anyone listening now at uh, libertarianprogressive.com where we have about 35 interviews so far. We're going to try to get up to the number 50 representing one from each state um, of independent third party candidates who are on the ballots and uh, the only third option in their specific district. And so uh, Again, we've been talking with Paul Rizzo, Libertarian candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, District 15 in Pennsylvania. Uh, please check out his website, Rizzo, the number four, congress.com. And, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today and uh, to share your platform and your, and your vision and, and uh, what you're running on and to let people know about your candidacy. And uh, so good luck in that. And you know, I hope you have a good day. Thanks so much, sir. Oh, thank you so much for having me.